Welcome. Welcome to one of the last sessions here at Open Source Summit North America. Second to last. Second to last. Thank you for that. And we're happy you're here. We're happy all of you are here. Hopefully more, uh, stri uh, more come in. Um, but logically securing the illogical, logical use of large language models. Yes, we did that. And that could be the reason why there's so few of us here today, because <laughs> we, we, we did that. But, but what this is centered on is, um, you know, the use of large language models today, and, and there's open source large language models, and then of course there's large language models that's, that, that's, that are being built by, by you know, major corporations. Um, but they're easily down, downloadable, and you can download them, and then you can use them. Oh, hell. <laughs> yeah, I can't get away. Um, they're, they're, they're downloadable. They're usable. But after you download them, you're, you are uh, taking on a whole bunch of risk. And there's a whole bunch of risk in using them as well. So what we want to do here is um, help you understand some of the fundamental things we use today, security-wise, um, to help you handle that risk just a little bit better and with a little bit uh, more uh, peace of mind. Anyway, uh, about us. Sarah Evans, I work at Dell Technologies in the office of the CTO. I do security innovation research and development, and I also participate in OpenSSF, very involved in the governance committee, the technical advisory council, and several of the working groups, including the AIML working group. And I'm Jay White. Um, I'm a security principal program manager for Microsoft, uh, vice chair of the board of directors for o Oasis Open, co-chair of supply integrity working group in the Open SSF, also part of the technical advisory council and co-chair of the AIML security working group with my friend here, Mihai, sitting down here in the front row for us. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, and of course, you saw her LinkedIn before. You see my LinkedIn here. Please, by all means, feel free to reach out and say hi or to give your dismay at the presentation you're going to see. We will prefer you like it, but just in case you don't, I'll take those as well. All right, <laughs> all right this is our agenda. Um, we're going to go over LLMs for innovative for, for innovative use cases, right? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about LLMs uh, with enterprise-grade security. I'm right? talk about that as well. Um, understanding LLM use risk, right? So these are, these are very important items um, um, to consider. Very sim simplistic in their nature, but, but important to go over just because mentally, uh, especially when you've been doing this for a long time, out of sight, out of mind, and you're not really considering the little little small things anymore. But anyway, we're going to go into risk management, right? So sometimes the fundamentals are good for something, right? So understanding risk management, understanding the fundamentals and how you can use those to help you manage uh, risk while you're using uh, large language models. But the, what, what we're going to use here are security controls in this 800-53, right? We're all familiar with that. But we're going to also look at how that maps with um, AI security risk framework, uh, security risk management framework, and that's the RMF 1.0, also out in this, which, by the way, is actually pretty good, right? Um, <clears throat> then we're going to talk about specific controls uh, that can help in most cases. We chose four of them for a reason, right? Um, because these things that we're all familiar with, and you don't understand just how important these things are, especially when you have such an emerging situation like this, sometimes if you can do things like simple access control, right? Who has access to what? How do they have access to it? Can, this, can somebody in your org just download something and bring, right? All that kind of stuff, right? Incident response. So what happens if something goes wrong? Um, you know, what, what do, you, do you have the right uh, triage situation ahead of you? Do you have the right, um, you know, team that goes out there because the team looks a little bit different now when you're dealing with uh, information, when you're dealing with large language models that have to be trained on specific data sets. The, the, the nature of how you handle those incidents become a little different. Is it a security incident? Is it a privacy incident now? Depending upon the nature of the data that the LLM was trained on, 
Right? We don't know. Right? So those things to consider, right? Um, configuration management, all familiar with that. And then ultimately, uh, supply chain risk management. Um, then we're going to go into a couple of the frameworks and tools that we already use today, right? So, um, you know, architectures and frameworks to the rescue. That, that question mark there is, the, is there for a reason, right? Um, to, to, to the rescue? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, S2C2F, uh, which, is, which is an exciting um, consumer focused uh, supply chain security framework that we're currently uh, uh, evolving and, and building as a project out of the Open SSF. Um, we're actually uh, getting ready to put that through a process to become an international standard shortly, right? So, so all exciting stuff with that. But also zero trust architecture, right? And we're gonna have an exciting video to show you there too to, to drive our point home why these things are important. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna talk about applying current enterprise grade security risk controls to LLM innovations, right? So we're gonna, so we, so we're telling you about the innovate, innovative use cases in the beginning. We're telling you about enterprise, enterprise grade security in the beginning, and then we're gonna end with actually applying those and what that looks like as we go forward. Um, are there any questions about the agenda before we drive on? All right. Warning. You can't unhear what you're about to hear. So as we all know, knowledge is power. And so what we're gonna talk about is how you don't have to be a security expert to be a security champion. So in my role in R&D, I work with some of the smartest people I know, data scientists, hardware engineers, software developers. And when I talk to them, sometimes, or, or others just in industry, they'll say, oh, well, I'm not a security person. And so what I'm trying to do and what Jay and I have had conversations about in the past is how can we bring some of this knowledge and information that we hold near and dear to our hearts about security to this emerging technology that you are all working with. Just one moment. Give me a After this short break. Yeah, I'm just going to mute this. Gonna That's okay. This we're, we're all queued up for the video. So he's got the audio coming through the speakers and everything. So we just... Outstanding. Okay. All right. Apologies. Had to mute. Had to mute some stuff. All right. Okay. So LLMs are a very interesting, innovative use case, and so this, the speed at which we're exploring and understanding and beginning to use these is kind of going at a breakneck, very fast speed. And so I love this quote: "It's easy to make something cool with LLMs, but very hard to make something production ready with them because there's a lot involved with that." And so we wanted to start with this beginning premise of Hugging Face. You go to huggingface.com, you download a model. Um, how easy is that? How hard is that? How, how quick can we get into uh, needing to understand and apply security concepts to what we're innovating with? So I um, took a few minutes to actually go to Hugging Face and, um, you know, huggingface.com. I was like, this is cool. The AI community building the future. Um, and so what I did was, this is real quick, I'm just going to move you through the, the different clicks that I had. The first thing I noticed was there's a list of models I can start to download. Click the first one, Mistral, I've heard of that, sounds good. Uh, the next thing it needed me to do was create an account. So I was able to create an account really quickly, use my work email. And then I needed to train it. So I had to pick where I was going to train it, pick the first option there. Um, how do I want to fine tune this? Um, so I just am clicking the first option all the way down. So it had me pick a license, it had me pick um, the space, the SDK. Um, so I'm just like cooking with gas here, just clicking through. And then I got to this last screen. It's asking me for information about some access control. How do I want to configure things? Where do I want to pull in some dependencies from? And so I had all that up and running in maybe a minute. So it is so quick and so fast to get to this really cool new technology. But the part that we really have to be proactive about, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking to you about today, is then what? Now that you have this, these tools and you're innovating, when do you slow down? Or when do you know yellow light to proceed with caution? And so how do enterprises that are trying to innovate to go to market and, and have um, really good profit and bring new business capabilities and savings to the business, how do they know if they 
are adding the right enterprise security controls. Uh, I also want to show you an example of how these architectures can get real complex really fast. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about security controls today. So this was actually just announced, um, I think on Tuesday, um, the Linux Foundation in partnership um, with Intel and several other companies are starting this open platform for enterprise AI. And so they showed an example of um, a pipeline blueprint using retrieval augmented generation flow. And I thought, oh, perfect. This is a great example of how the architectures start to get complicated real fast in a hurry to the point where there's a group of a collection of companies that want to come together in the open to figure out how to get some of these pieces under the hood to work together to have production grade enterprise security. So this is really getting to the heart of supply chain risk management. So notice we've got a curvy road ahead. So we're going to pay attention to the road, sides and the, the road signs and the street signs and give you some more information about how we're thinking about securing LLMs. All right. So <laughs> we need, you need your driver's license for, <laughs> for the rules of the road. <laughs> like that. I was going to put mine up. I decided not to <laughs> pick the pictures different. Uh, whose risk is it, right? So when we're understanding, uh, understanding LLM and uh, use risk, whose risk is it, right? Um, one of the things that, that we consider is, you know, who's ultimately making the decision? I'll give you a, an example, right? So today, when we're considering building products, and this is usually happening across many different organizations, and building products and services, um, you're downloading open source components, right? You have an engineer who needs a component. They need to download a component. Um, they're bringing it into their environment, right? You may have a process to do so. Hopefully you do, and if you don't, go ahead and pull up S2C2 up to help you uh, with a good ingestion, uh, ingestion process for bringing in your, your open source component. But what happens when you bring it in and what happens when you've identified that that component may have vulnerabilities? Who ultimately makes the decision on whether or not you're willing to accept that risk, right? And at what, at, at what risk level does that risk get accepted? And when do you escalate to a business owner, right? That hardly ever happens today because we are moving at the speed of light, right? We're moving so fast, we wanna get products to market so quick that risk is, is accepted at the engineer level, right? Um, when do we begin to care? especially in such an emerging environment as this. When do we begin to care about, about that, that level of risk, right? Um, before the download, most certainly after, right? we'd like for you to become aware uh, of managing risk with the decisions uh, you know, to increase and fine tune the LLM um, so it can be more accurate, right? We, we, we'd like for that to happen. Um, but ultimately, and you'll, you'll read, uh, that third bullet there, right? Um, but all that third bullet says that, look, as long as the model is somewhat tuned, as long as you can apply some type of neural network to it so that it can, that, that deep learning can be enabled, um, what's important to an organization is customer one. After that, after you've reached customer one and after revenue is being generated, what about customer two, three, four, five? Does the business care, right? Does the business care? Like, and I say like, for, so for most of us, um, and I say us meaning like, you know, you're, you're Microsoft, like I work for and, um, you know, Google, right? Where we pander to the, our largest customer uh, in the world, which is the government. So after you've generated or built these AI tools and you've brought in and trained your models and it seems to work for that one control group, right? Do you care about the other partner or, or the other customers out there that may want to use, right? As long as you have the data that does this, that, that data may not work for them, right? And then the, the errors may, may occur and all that kind of stuff. And we're gonna get into that in a second. Um, but here we understand that there is a large intersection between risk and responsible AI. That's slightly out of scope for this discussion, but 
as I clearly state here, that could be a good topic for a later presentation. That's, that's wink, wink, so all, all around. Uh, who knows, we may do that later. Um, ultimately, which is the reason why we have our driver's license here, what are the rules um, of the road as far as security is concerned? Right. So there are a few challenges um, to AI and, and, and LLM use, and uh, we're going to talk about that and why risk management. So, so why is risk management important with these? Um, the data LLMs are trained on will change over time, right? Data gets old, it needs to be updated. So as you update the data, so then must you then you know, continuously fine tune and uh, update your LLMs. Um, also along with this, y y some LLMs come pre-trained. What are they pre-trained on, right? Uh, how many of us are downloading LLMs that have been pre-trained, how many of them are, un, are, helped, are unlearning the LLMs? How many of us are going through the process of unlearning the LLMs and then retraining them on the data that we want to train them on? How many of us are just putting extra data onto it, which could in effect confuse the living hell? I, I, I just, uh, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, but due to the complexity of AI systems and how they're deployed, there's increasing difficulty in detecting and responding to LLM tuning errors, and neural network issues. That's where I was going with that. Right. Um, this is a new frontier. And, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're heading in such a place so fast that we're not even considering uh, that maybe, as we said before, slow down just a little bit. Right? Um, so things to consider the socio-technical nature of AI systems. And what does that mean? Things are behavioral based. Um, when, you train, uh, when you train a model with certain data, you're training a model with certain pieces of data based on what you want to train it on at the time. And that could be very behavioral, right? Beha there could be a lot of, a lot of um, the social dynamic around the way you train these models is just as important as the data and with how the models are trained to begin with. And that changes over time, different social dynamics. I had a great conversation um, with an individual uh, about a technology that he is um, building right now. And he's building it based off of intent. Well, I said, whose intent? The individual's intent, the role's intent, the business unit's intent, the org's intent, the enterprise's intent, whose intent? And does that, is that tent, intent specific to a, to a cultural, to a culture, a specific culture? Specific cultures have different intent and different ways that they speak and different ways they, they articulate, things to be careful of. But that's where we look at risk management. So risk management in this form equals responsible AI. And responsible AI, responsible AI equals trust. And we consider trust, trust is very human centric and to verify is to automate. So then we need the right tools in place to properly verify that which is being trusted, right? Um, they, they won't leave me alone, people. I, I've muted all I can, I can't, they won't, they won't, they won't, they won't leave me alone. <laughs> uh, so with all those challenges, there's, there's a lot of unknowns. There's unknowns about AI. I don't think that's, I'm sharing anything new that you don't have already on your mind when you come in here today. But there are a lot of knowns. And so that's what we want to spend some time talking to you about, about the security knowns that even though we're very excited to use this emerging technology and we're innovating at a very rapid pace, and we are still figuring things out um, and learning as we go, that there are just some fundamental security things that we have to be doing based on lessons that we've learned in the past uh, that will really help us as we are moving into this unknown space down the, down the road. So this first one I want to talk about is, is called NIST 853. It's currently on revision five. And so for those of you who've never gone to a NIST document, there are these really nice PDFs that they go on for pages 
tons of good information. And so there are people who will spend an entire security career getting very comfortable with what's in these documents and so they can, you know, help make sure that products after all the innovation is done are good to go out. So what we want to do is we want to bring that in security by design. For those of you who are in the room and you are playing around with LLMs and AI, we want to expose you to some of these concepts early on so that you can use them and be educated on the, some of the existing fundamentals today. Um, so just giving you a few screenshots as we go here quickly through some of the highlights that we wanted to bring to you about these security controls. All right, front page, very nice. Security and privacy controls. And yeah, that's fine. We'll move through these pretty fast. So this is something that's hit like on page seven. It's a whole bunch of white space around it, and then we've got this screenshot. I want to call out the first sentence and the last sentence. As we push computers to the edge, building an increasingly complex world of interconnected systems and devices, innovating with LLMs, security and privacy continue to dominate the national dialogue. Um, skipping down to that last sentence, the objective is to make the systems we depend on more penetration resistant to attacks, limit the damage from those attacks when they occur, and make the systems resilient, survivable, and protective of individuals' privacy. Because people who are going to take advantage of security flaws in LLMs, they're going to be building off all the flaws that they already know about for today's systems. And what we're seeing is often what's old is new again because some of the security fundamentals that we know about aren't being um, brought forth um, as in conversation as, as early as they could with the innovation around LLMs. All right, so when you're in your table of contents, it's giving you all these different controls. These are control families. And so Jay mentioned during our agenda that we're gonna talk about four. The four we're gonna talk about, we're gonna hit on access control, um, configuration management, incident response, and supply chain risk management. So if you've never been in this document before, let's give you um, kind of a, def a definition of a control and then what are control families. So the security controls are the safeguards or countermeasures employed within a system or an organization to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system and its information and to manage information security risk. So if you're applying the, the, um, the framework of NIST 853 to whatever new technology you're working with, you're going to be helping to improve the security of it. So the four we focused on access control is who or what services can access information. Configuration management is around how systems are configured and how changes are controlled. And that change control one is an interesting one as we're innovating with LLMs. Incident response, there's gonna be a need to, I can tell you, there's going to be a need to report and respond to incidents, including system vulnerabilities, which are based off of that CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, or availability. So even though the technology we're working with is new, a lot of these fundamentals apply to the way we access the information. And then finally, supply chain risk management. You saw my slide earlier from the open platform for enterprise um, AI. Things can get, you know, just like with software that we've learned over the past decade or so, things get very uh, connected over time. And so thinking about all the system components that we're bringing together, making sure that they're secure, reliable, and resilient. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention here, um, when we consider the application of these, uh, these security controls, remember, I, I, this is something I said a, l a long time ago, as, as much of a science as um, information security is, as, as much of a business function as it is, you, 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 you have to remember that there's so much art in this. You can get creative, right? Um, so when you look at some of the controls in each one of these control families, understand that, that you can get creative and make these applicable to the nature of your business, right? Remember, security is a business function. Make it to the, nat to the nature of your business and such that you, you can, you can always have some degradation in productivity, but that should not be your aim. You should be helping to enhance productivity, but making sure those business transactions uh, remain secure. So you got to get creative. This is the time for creativity, by the way, because the, this is so new, this is so emerging, 
that you have to now put your thinking cap on. You can't just apply control, keep it moving, let somebody audit it. Oh, it's there, right? You know the, 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 the image, my favorite, the, with the car, with the big giant wheels, but you got the factory tire on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, my, that's my, one of my favorite images. <laughs> now, meeting compliance requirements is ain't all, isn't all, not, not in this case. You have to get creative, you have to be exact, right? And remember what I said before, um, risk management, responsible AI, responsible AI is trust, and you need your customer's trust. You drive on. Again, so if you've never been in NIST 853, I've given you a very lovely screenshot of what the access control family looks like. And so it goes through in very logical detail about all the different types of things and if, even if you just read this outline, as you're innovating with your AI and your LLM system, and you think about, you know, how would someone take my innovation and apply uh, privileged access managed to it to, to make sure that just certain administrators or certain accounts have access to things? And if you're building it with just root access to everything, or if you're building it without a password, let's innovate on that because there are some real opportunities to lean forward with what we know about security controls as we are um, in this new breaking space of large language models. And uh, just as a, as a, a, ch a, check, a check online, um, can anyone think of any access controls that, because the whole idea of this, right, is to say, hey, what's, what's old is new again, and the fundamentals matter. Can anyone think of any access controls, especially from the list here that you just, I mean, I just need one right off the bat that's like, you need to do this. Well, that, yeah, you, you want to do that, that's good. I was thinking least privileges. I was thinking least privileges right off the bat. You want to limit who is downloading what in this particular case. And who's introducing what into your environment right off the bat, you want to, you want to limit that. One of the things we've been talking about with large language models is, and that's why these architectures can get a little bit complex, is if you're pulling data and you, you fine-tuned a model with, your, with corporate you know, or private data, and you have different people throughout your company asking the large language model questions, um, can the CEO see more than the security analyst or the executive assistant? Mm -hmm. Should they see different things if they each put in the same prompt? Mm -hmm. Should there be some type of permissions? Mm -hmm but that's gonna require some innovation and some creativity to get to that level of control that we're um, used to when we're in a SharePoint or a JIRA website. Absolutely. Okay, so there's also the AI risk management framework. And if what I wanted to show with this screenshot is there's also a lot of supporting tools that go with this. So there, look, there's a playbook, there's a roadmap, there's a crosswalk, so kind of, the rules of the road, there's a lot of tools here that have just come out very recently um, that if, if you can kind of read through these or someone on your team who's interested in this, there's a lot of good information out there about what are the basics that, that we do know about AI risk. And so the goal of the AI RMF is to offer a resource to the organizations designing, developing, deploying, or using AI systems to help manage many of the risks of AI and to promote trustworthy and responsible development. And we're gonna talk a lot about that one on the top left, mapping, because we wanna map what we do know about today to how we're experimenting with things in the future. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about that last line. Yeah, so you wanna address new risks as they emerge, and that's what this framework does. The part about using LLMs and the part about creating different AI systems is you don't know what you don't know. Um, what the, Oh, I can't win for losing today, people. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You, you, don't, you, don't know, you don't know what you don't know, okay? Um, th throughout my, throughout my, my time, I've been, I've been in security for, for, for over 20 years. And, you know, going from administrative, to technical, to physical, and doing the pen test and everything like that, and you realize you close one vulnerability, right? You find one vulnerability, um, you, 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 you remediate that, close that, what you don't know is by, by remediating you know, a vulnerability, you could very well open up and make room for another one, right? You, you close one port or you close one port of access or, or something like that, one in, in, ingress point, you open up another one inadvertently. 
you apply a tool, you apply an application, an application opens up another port somewhere else, inadvertently, right? You, 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 you don't know what you don't know when you're trying and you're not, you're not, you know, you're, you're thinking, but that's the problem, you're thinking and, you, and you're, you're applying and you're, and you're trying to work the problem. Things happen. In this space, that is the case. And you will most certainly have new risks that you've never, ever, ever, ever even considered before, right? Um, and, the A, and, this, and this framework, the risk management framework, AI risk management framework, is designed to help address new risks as they emerge, um, harnessing the three harms to promote harmony. What are those three harms? Harm to people, harm to organization, harm to the ecosystem, right? So you address those three harms, it promotes harmony. TM, okay, <laughs> T TM. <laughs> um, so this is our life cycle and key dimensions of, of an AI system, right? And you can go around the horn there. Uh, for our discussion, where we're living now is that bottom right-hand side, right? We're over there in the AI model. We're talking about verify and validate. We're talking about build and using the model. But this whole circle here, and you see what happens right in the middle, people and planet. <clears throat> what makes what we're doing today so different than what we did in the past? The idea was to protect the data. The idea was to protect the money. The idea was to protect, I mean, in some instances, health, right? If we're talking about utilities and, and infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, you want to make sure that people are safe as well. This is an ultimate people and planet situation. The more you train these LLMs on, on all kinds of data, the more ways you have to impact everyone's life. Everyone's life gets impacted in some way, shape, or form. I, I, one of the things I, I said in discussions with, the blur between what's a privacy incident and a security incident can't be more profound now than ever before. Because in aggregate, now it used to be in aggregate, um, a low risk, many low risk vulnerabilities in aggregate can, can become a larger risk vulnerability, but it's still a security risk, right? In this particular instance, many medium, low, or even high risk security vulnerabilities can equal a larger privacy vulnerability, depending upon the kind of data that LLM was trained on. I, I, I pointed out to someone, I said, well, look, if you train an LLM and, and that LLM now knows, uh, you know, trivial data, where a person's favorite barbershop is, where a person's favorite taco shop is, where a person gets their oil, um, gets their oil did, where a person uh, goes get Jamba Juice, uh, where a person goes to the gym, where a person buys their socks, their Costco they use, right? You can triangulate where that person lives. Within, with, I'm talking about within maybe 500 yards of where they live, right? PII, you, you not, you're now into their private information. So the little security vulnerabilities, now you know where they go, but now you can triangulate where they actually live. These are things to consider when we're, when we're talking about uh, the key dimensions here. And we down here, AI actors involved in these dimensions who perform and manage design development, uh, deployment, evaluation, use of AI systems, drive AI risk management efforts are the primary AI RMF audience. That's all of us. Because as engineers, as people who are downloading LLMs, as people who want to create the next best thing, it's our responsibility to consider these, to consider these items. But as I said before, there's a few slides before, when do we care, right? Because as long as it works, and we can say, man, it works. This is great, push it out, without considering those respective um, consequences. Um, so we talked before, and, and, uh, and, and Sarah let you know, we'll be living over there in that map portion, because when we consider risk and risk management, when we consider responsibility, when we consider AI actors, and we consider this, it's really lying inside of that map 
uh, that map control family. Um, it's considered, it's, it's lying right inside of that. So we see here the function establishes context to frame uh, risks related to AI systems. And of course, you have the life cycle of many independent activities uh, involving a diversity of actors. So you're looking at it from a frame where you're saying, okay, so these are our risks in front of us. How do we plan on attacking these risks? And how do we plan on doing it responsibly? Right? This is the part where we verify and we validate. This is the part where trustworthiness takes hold. Right? That's why this map, uh, this, this map uh, function is, 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 is extremely important. Um, so when we consider using map, when we consider using uh, NIST, when we consider why we're using it, and then we consider now, let's go back to our original scenario. What are some of the security frameworks we have that may encompass a lot of the, remember what we said, these are like hundreds of pages, right? We talked about that, hundreds of pages. We pointed you to them, read them. We have great reading. I'm telling you, on a, on a five hour flight, if you get on that flight and it's like eight o'clock in the morning and you got nothing but airspace and opportunity, except if you're on Boeing, you have airspace and opportunity for real. Any Boeing people in the room too soon? Too soon. Um, one of these frameworks can help. So here we start with S2C2F. Ingesting, ingesting, did I say ingesting? Ingesting large language models off a of hugging face, right? Remember our first, from our first scenario. Um, yep, so um, there's a hint. We're going to give you a scenario. We have two security scenarios mm -hmm. that have occurred. Um, so our first scenario is when, um, this practice number two, scan it. You're downloading something. You're ingesting it as open source off of the internet. Scan it. So now let's come up with our first scenario. Scan new stuff you download off the internet. A lot of us do this on our home computers. So um, there was, this is an article off of JFrog where they had um, malware that was built into the models that people were downloading off Hugging Face, and it was a backdoor into the data and um, whatever they had access to from that computer or onto that network. And so this is an example of supply chain risk management and configuration management. Those basic controls about scanning something new that you're downloading off the internet is going to make a big difference, even though the technology that we're downloading is new and interesting and innovative. This basic process of scanning things um, still applies. And, you know, JFrog is a great tool. It's just an example of a tool. Just like on your home PC, you're going to run a firewall. You're going to use an antivirus, anti-malware. The main thing is to do it. Okay, the, we are um, going to speed through this, this next scenario, the second one. So there are best practices when you're de designing anything with security in mind. And so back in, what's the date there? 2021, the nation had, the White House had an executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. And you can see there at the bottom left, section three was to begin to modernize, modernize federal government cybersecurity, leveraging zero trust security principles. In my mind, zero trust security is just the way I wish that we had been thinking about security all along. And so here's a hint for our second scenario. You see that there's five major tenets of zero trust, and I have one circled called never trust, always verify. So you're going to build in explicit trust points instead of just trusting. All right, so we don't have time for this video. It's linked in, we'll have the slides posted. So it's, a, it's an example of John Kinderbag talking about what is a protect surface and what's an attack surface. Um, it is a vendor-oriented video, so I've got you focused down to just the piece we wish we could have shown for you today. Um, but I will point out, with zero trust security, you'll hear a lot of things about it as you start to learn about it. And some people will say, is it a journey? Is it a destination? Do I have to do all zero trust? Do I have to do some? Should I not do any if I can't do it all? And so what I would say just very quickly is that you can start at any time with some and work your way to all if it makes sense. But you want to always start with your most important data first. So in your application or your open source project, what's your president? What's the most important thing that you're protecting? So let's go to our second scenario. All right. So this is an example of um, an open source framework called Ray that was involved in scaling AI applications. 
and it actually had a CVE and a vulnerability filed against it because the administration account that had root access to the different AI workloads didn't have any authentication on it. And so um, the, the developer actually um, disputed this saying that the no authentication was an intentionally designed feature and that they um, put very clearly in their documentation that you needed to put a nice good segmentation perimeter around the, the soft squishy AI middle. And so if we follow the zero trust security practices, we want to yes, have a perimeter, but we also always need to have authentication on something as important as the, the um, administrator ac account to our AI model. So AI models new, authentication access, not relying just on a perimeter, that's a security fundamental that we can be using today. All right, so kind of in closing. Yeah. So applying current enterprise-grade security controls to element of innovation, preemptive conversation. This is where I talk about preemptive risk management. Uh, what things should we put in place before anything actually occurs? Far too often, we get reactive to certain things. Something happens, and all of a sudden, now we want to create budgets, and, and now we want to scramble and put things. But what kind of things can we do early on? We talked about these things. Let's consider access control, configuration management, incident response, supply chain risk management. Um, as you're adopting concepts and ideology applied to the use of LLMs, let's put those things in place. We have the tools. We have the knowledge. We have everything we need to do it now. We can just put those things in place. And of course, when you're innovating, think about the impact of where you're adjusting uh, the technology. Think about your protect surface. Think about the individuals that are going to be using. Think about not just customer one, but two, three, four, five, six. Let that help uh, bridge any security gaps. Let that help uh, with how you're designing, uh, developing, and deploying in, in your environment. Um, we're still, we still have a lot of uncertainty, right? Uh, we don't know what the future holds for this, and that's the exciting part about it, right? Um, we, we love technology so much. We love how innovative things are. So that, that's, we, we love that we don't know where it's going, right? But we also have to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we keep our feet planted solid. We keep our eye on the road in front of us. And, and you know, yeah, wild things are veering left to right. We got to make sure that we're, you know, and we got somebody watching our back too, right? Um, what are all the security lessons and fundamentals from the past decade or so for software development that still apply to AI use cases? Hint, we covered them. Well said. And that's, uh, that's it for us. And we're actually a few minutes over, so thank you for your, for your time and staying with us today. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to stick on by, but we think about the, you know, the, the lady from downstairs who's checking badges is going to come up here and and, and, and tackle us. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.